Good morning, everybody. This is a live briefing discussing some new Hurricane Sally data uh, that has become available. And uh, this uh, pressure data uh, was basically comparing pressure measured at three different locations in Gulf Shores. Uh, Mark, or Chase and Spin on Twitter, was able to triangulate uh, those different peaks uh, and, uh, and uh, troughs in the pressure data in the front eye wall. Uh, we were able to experience those tornado-like vortices that were whipping around that front eye wall as a strengthening Hurricane Sally was approaching Gulf Shores. And uh, we were able to collaborate with Josh Morgerman, or eye cyclone, who was measuring pressure data with his Kestrel handheld unit that he mounted at a fixed location, synced all of the clocks as well between the handheld Kestrel and his computers. And we also used the one second pressure data from Mike Tice as a Windy Palms unit that we deployed about two and a half miles to the west of the subsonic sensor. Uh, those three different peaks were in the front eye wall just as the pressure was subsiding rapidly. And each of those tornado-like vortices was associated with a violent pressure whipsaw that caused our ears to pop, even painfully so, in that front eye wall, and also associated with the wind direction change, getting a bit more north northeasterly and then shifting back to that uh, east-southeasterly direction, uh, and associated with the big pop of wind as well that we experienced on the ground. Um, and including a measured a triple digit wind gust with a handheld Kestrel unit uh, at our location there in Gulf Shores. But I'm gonna zoom in on the high resolution data. The subsonic sensor is measuring pressure data at a rate of 16 times a second. Josh's was measuring data at a rate of uh, uh, every minute. And then Mike's uh, was measuring data every second, uh, but truncated those decimal points. And Mike, uh, uh, Mark, uh, Chase and Spin was able to do some complex math and uh, compute the speed uh, by triangulating uh, those different pressure whipsaws and those tornado-like vortices. And we computed uh, that they were whipping around, tearing through Gulf Shores at a speed of 85 miles an hour associated with their own rotational velocities. So it's easy to see that the ground relative wind uh, can definitely be well into the triple digits and cause quite a bit of damage. And that's one thing we noticed when we were doing a damage survey after the fact uh, between Gulf Shores and Orange Beach and Perdido Key was that there are very narrow swaths of extreme damage caused by these tornado-like whirls that were whipping around uh, inside the northern eyewall. And now I'm going to show you the map of the three different locations uh, that we used uh, for this triangulation and this calculation. Uh, a little bit inland, uh, just a, about a, a two miles inland. This is Josh Morgerman's location. He had a handheld unit that he placed in a controlled environment and then ventured down uh, to the barrier island to experience the eye wall as well as the eye. This is the location of the subsonic sensor uh, measuring that pressure data at a rate of 16 times a second. This is where we wrote out the eye as well and experienced some of those dramatic wind gusts. This is the location uh, of the Windy Palms project of Mike Tice. This is where we deployed it two and a half miles to the west of the subsonic sensor. And the goal of the Windy Palms project was to deploy where we had purely onshore flow measured by that hurricane. So initially we saw Hurricane Sally was gonna come ashore near Dauphin Island, which would have put pure southerly flow right over the Windy Palms project. And we would have measured that unimpeded wind off of the Gulf of Mexico uh, to sample just the pure strength of uh, Hurricane Sally. But then it ended up coming in a little bit further east and it worked out perfectly for this pressure calculation because we intercepted basically the centroid of the eye wall. Uh, in fact, even just a little bit right of center in this location. And we were able to sample those tornado-like vortices that were whipping from east to west and rotating anti-cyclonically. Uh, so those uh, meso vortices uh, would pass our, lo uh, pass our different locations. First our location, uh, then Josh's location, and then Mike's uh, recording a pressure signature. Uh, as they pass through these different locations. And when you have three locations, you can triangulate uh, these tornado-like vortices and compute their speed uh, and their heading as they're uh, whipping around inside uh, that northern eye wall. So this is Gulf Shores. This is the main drag down to the beach. And these are the three different locations of the pressure data uh, that we use to triangulate uh, those tornado-like vortices. And uh, here's some of the radar data. Uh, that showed uh, those tornado-like vortices in action. Let me get rid of, uh, of my uh, fontanel there. There we go. So here you can see those tornado-like vortices, and you can see the undulations in the reflectivity pattern of the eye wall. Uh, that shows that there are definitely vortices in the inner eye wall, uh, basically tornado-like whirls whipping around inside the eye. And here you can see the, uh, uh, one of those uh, signatures whipping by our location. This is the location of the subsonic uh, uh, data set. 
Uh, also, Jess Simlin uh, was the location of Josh's. And then a little bit to the west, two and a half miles to the west, was the location of the Windy Palms there. Uh, but this is one of those tornado-like vortices that was whipping around inside uh, the inner eye wall. And you can definitely see that velocity signature. You can see the uh, wind away from the radar. You can see the wind toward the radar, which showed that those uh, tornado-like whirls, in this case, were anti-cyclonic in nature, but whipping around inside the general uh, cyclonic flow of the eye wall. And uh, these were the uh, tornado-like vortices. There are actually four of them that we observed inside the eye wall, spinning by our locations at the surface and having a pressure whipsaw associated with painful ear popping as well as they whipped by our three different locations and uh, also contributed to some extreme winds. Narrow swaths of total destruction uh, that were caused between Gulf Shores, Orange Beach, and Perdido Key. Some of the areas were completely spared, whereas in between you saw these swaths of tornado-like vortices creating quite a bit of damage. Here you can see another one of those on the other eye wall uh, whipping around. And so you have four of these, usually Four to five of these tornado-like vortices are observed inside the strongest of hurricanes. Hurricane Michael also had these inside, but the last time I measured uh, pressure data inside one of these was in Hurricane Harvey, and back then we were only measuring that at a rate of one time a second, and you can certainly see those pressure oscillations in the front eye wall that I'm about to show you in the, the high-resolution data. But now with the subsonic sensor, it's capable of measuring infrasound uh, frequency, infrasound waves, gravity waves, and uh, also very fine scale uh, pressure oscillations at a rate of 16 times a second, basically unprecedented uh, resolution uh, in this pressure data collected inside of a hurricane. And that has made it possible for us uh, to actually uh, compute and triangulate these different curves. And so these are the three curves. The yellow is the subsonic, uh, the brown curve there in the middle, that's uh, Josh Morgerman's uh, I cyclone Kestrel data. And then uh, the bottom, the blue curve, uh, that's the uh, pressure data from the Windy Palms project uh, with those decimals uh, truncated a little bit. That's why they appear to be in step functions, uh, but you can actually smooth out uh, those curves uh, just a bit as well. And uh, these last two oscillations, those are the ones that uh, we were tracking. So uh, this first one right here that you can see, and that's these two waves, these two uh, pressure pumps, as we call it, were the uh, peaks that we were able to track and triangulate and compute their speed at a little over 85 miles an hour. And uh, that first one that you see on the upper left, this one was not as coherent amongst the three stations. So we had to throw out this pressure pump, uh, but we were able uh, to uh, track these two, these two vortices uh, and triangulate them uh, between the three stations and compute their speed at about 85 miles an hour. And uh, even though these appear to be different pressures, we had to offset them a little bit so that you could see these different peaks within the data. Here you can see the peaks in Mike's. You can also see the peaks in uh, iCyclone's data. And uh, you can also see the very high resolution pressure data of the subsonic sensor, sensor measuring uh, these uh, pressure pumps at a rate of 16 times a second. And one thing you can see is even though you have these tornado-like vortices creating these Course, coarser uh, undulations in pressure. You can also see gravity waves uh, that are measured by the subsonic sensor. These violent up and down motions uh, it, with uh, very quiet periods in between. We were wondering if this was due to a pressure shield uh, caused by the easterly winds passing over a building nearby, or if these were actually associated with weaknesses in the wind. Uh, looks like these pressure pumps were definitely associated with increases in the wind, followed by a bit of a decrease uh, in those fine scale oscillations. We were trying to figure out if that was a pressure shield or if that was actually associated with wind, uh, but you could definitely see these fine scale oscillations, gravity waves or infrasound waves um, within uh, these, uh, these curves, these tornado-like vortices. Almost a fractal pattern is apparent in the very fine scale uh, resolution data. And so now I want to show you the uh, zoomed out view and uh, show you the three different curves that we analyzed. There you can see those, uh, the three different vortices indicated by the green arrow there uh, that we were able to track. And uh, again, the yellow is the subsonic data. This is Josh Morgerman's Kestrel data. And interestingly, you can also see this little jump here in uh, both of the data sets. 
and uh, there was just a little bit of a, an equal part of the pressure. It was falling dramatically as the uh, center of the hurricane was approaching. This is the pressure gradient that drives uh, the wind around, but there was just a little bit of a wobble right there as that pressure was falling, and I think that that was as the hurricane stalled out just a little bit on approach to the coast. It's also possible that that was a tornado-like vortex in one of the convective outer bands. Uh, but the flow overall was pretty laminar. And then when it hit that little jump in pressure, you could see some fine scale oscillations in the gravity wave signature. And that uh, likely shows that that pressure pump was also associated uh, with a surge in winds. I think that this was as we were out in the street uh, covering the storm on foot, uh, getting those tornado-like vortices around. And then the eye wall arrived right about here. This is the eye wall section of Hurricane Sally. And that's when we got those uh, pressure oscillations uh, uh, that we were able to track uh, three of those different ones. This was the initial one and then a couple of additional pumps a little bit further down the line that we were able to track. And uh, even though this shows that the pressure has different minimums, we just use this for the sake of comparison. So these are just a little bit offset uh, so that you're able to see uh, and, and line up the different pressure peaks within these curves. Uh, and you can see that they're very close together, which shows that these peaks were traveling very fast inside the eye wall at a speed of over 85 miles an hour. Uh, and you can also see that those pressure pumps were absent from the weaker, less convective back eye wall. And I also noticed this with Hurricane Harvey, that these tornado-like whirls were confined uh, to the front eye wall of the storm. A similar thing happened with Hurricane Sally, which was also a slowing down, intensifying tropical cyclone on approach to the coast. Uh, but this shows the value of having a network of pressure sensors and high-resolution pressure sensors out there because then you can triangulate and track these fine-scale features. If we had three subsonic sensors measuring data at a rate of 16 times a second, then we could even track these fine-scale oscillations and see how coherent those are or if those are uh, very uh, strong winds passing through the buildings creating those whirls or if they're actually coupled with the convection within the eye wall, which is what I expect. Uh, these are very coherent uh, pressure oscillations on the order of 200 pascals and uh, those can certainly cause uh, problems uh, with your hearing or painful uh, ear pops as well, even migraine headaches uh, given the arrival uh, of these pressure curves. And zooming out just a little bit, uh, you can see the three that we were able to track as well as that initial bounce uh, that was in uh, one of the outer bands, a convective outer band there of a tropical of, of a, a hurricane sally that came in as a category two but these are those tornado like whirls that we were able to track and uh, this one right here the second one was the most violent and the most intense and it was also tracked by all all three different pressure curves and uh, just a little bit delayed in time mike's uh, pressure was registered the latest because he was the furthest to the west by about two and a half miles uh, josh was closer to the subsonic sensor uh, so that peak was a bit closer and then here you can see the third, uh, the third peak or the third tornado-like vortex associated with a violent pressure whipsaw that we're able to track coming in just a little bit later in time and then delayed even further uh, by Mike's. And we were able to track uh, this data uh, moving at a rate uh, with these tornado-like vortices whipping at a rate of 85 miles an hour inside the eye. And this was that initial little jump uh, that I told you about in the pressure. So you can see that the pressure was falling rapidly as Hurricane Sally was approaching and then levels off just a bit, a bit and also associated with some substantial gravity wave activity before the uh, wind was a bit more laminar. And then you had the arrival of the eye wall right about here where those uh, tornado-like vortices uh, were arriving. And that's where the uh, most damaging winds were ravaging areas from Gulf Shores to Orange Beach to Perdido Key to Pensacola Beach out there. But this leveling off of the pressure, which was also measured by the Windy Palms Project and also Josh's handheld Kestrel shows that either Hurricane Sally stalled out briefly on approach or this was a convective outer band that was associated with a stagnation in pressure, uh, maybe going from a convective outer band to more of the moat uh, in between the arrival of the eye wall. And then you had a dramatic drop in pressure and the winds ramped up and increased dramatically as well. But this is interesting. This little jump here was associated with the wind pop as well. And I think that this is as we were on foot out in the street experiencing some of those intense but very gusty winds in a uh, convective band just on the outside of the inner eye wall and uh, basically a leveling off for a short time for about two minutes or about 20 minutes 
uh, here it appears. About 20 minutes, so you had that leveling off of the pressure before a dramatic fall uh, to that eye wall that was uh, characterized by violent pressure whipsaws, popping ears, and very damaging gusty winds uh, that passed through. And then we all uh, intercepted the eye, went out in the street, took photos, uh, chaser gathering, and uh, this is basically the calm eye right here, very laminar, calm flow. Uh, hardly even measuring any ripples out there or gravity wave activity. You can see a little pop right here in the middle. That was uh, basically a north-south uh, gravity wave that was associated with some breezy conditions inside the eye. Some raindrops were falling as well. You can maybe see a little bit of an indication of that in Josh's data, uh, but it seems uh, that that subtle fine scale gravity wave activity was only picked up uh, by the subsonic sensor right in the middle of the eye, definitely requiring that 16 times a second uh, resolution uh, to be able to capture that. But I think it's just awesome how you have these violent pressure whipsaws uh, also characterized by finer scale gravity wave activity. And if we had three subsonic sensors out there measuring data, we likely would have even been able to track those fine scale peaks uh, within that data. And uh, so uh, now to uh, calculate uh, some of those uh, different uh, measurements, basically calculating the speed uh, of the uh, violent pressure whipsaws in there. And this part of the video is when we were experiencing those to an extreme. And uh, the winds would shift too uh, with the passage of these uh, pressure whipsaws. Uh, they would basically uh, come through. The pressure oscillation would cause a popping of the ears. Uh, you'd have a shift in the wind uh, from an east-southeasterly direction or from a, to an east-northeasterly direction. The wind would focus on the north side of the structure and then would funnel through the south side of the structure as those winds would shift to an east-southeasterly direction. And definitely very gusty and convective as well, uh, those violent uh, pressure whipsaws. And now just to uh, share some of those uh, calculations. The minimum pressure uh, by the subsonic sensor was 968.24742 millibars. Josh's was 968.2 very close and then mike's was 968 millibars but it was uh, truncated data but the minimums were surprisingly close and mike's did not go below 968 but uh probably was about a similar so basically we offset these different curves uh, josh's by minus five millibars mike by minus 10 millibars so that you can track uh, those individual peaks and troughs. But if you do overlay them, uh, you'll see that they're very closely aligned. And uh, getting some of that final data uh, on the triangulation. The speed was uh, of that uh, second peak was 37.944 meters per second. They're traveling at 84.8 uh, miles per hour, uh, 136.6 kilometers per hour. Uh, with a bearing of uh, 52 degrees. And uh, of course, that was moving uh, basically east, southeast to west, northwest, uh, whipping through Gulf Shores, associated with uh, pretty strong wind pops as well uh, that went through. And uh, that's one thing that we definitely noticed as we were chasing this hurricane is intense pain in the ears. And that's as those uh, pressure whipsaws were going by, definitely supported by the data. Uh, the only time I remember experiencing those pressure whipsaws was in Hurricane Harvey back in 2017, and that was a similar slowing down but intensifying tropical cyclone, basically the worst uh, case scenario uh, for a tropical cyclone. And uh, that's also when you get incredibly damaging winds as those tornado-like vortices are cutting through, causing narrow swaths of tornado-like damage within uh, general large-scale damage uh, caused by these hurricanes. So that's our initial data set. That's the pressure data, uh, basically triangulating uh, the three data points, the subsonic sensor, uh, Josh Morgerman's handheld sensor, and also uh, Mike's Windy Palms located just a little bit further west out there as well. Uh, but this is basically a group of chasers coming together, collaborating on uh, calculating field science, and uh, definitely how things should be when we're out there uh, chasing. It's just awesome uh, for everybody to come together like this and share their data. And uh, hopefully it allows us to better understand these tropical cyclones. But I would say based on this data, when you have a slow moving 
tropical cyclone approaching the coast that is also intensifying with a convective front eye wall with clear undulations visible within the eye. Uh, you should definitely uh, prepare for extreme damaging, even tornado-like uh, conditions within the eye wall uh, that can cause total destruction in swaths. Even when you have a, a hurricane that's a category two hurricane that's intensifying, it's still capable of producing extreme wind speeds when these tornado-like vortices swing by. Wind speeds that uh, would compare to a much stronger hurricane, even a major hurricane out there, category three or four storm uh, in narrow swaths, just extreme destruction. And also you have the storm surge uh, that was comparable to a category two storm out there, uh, the worst of which we saw on the east side of Perdido Key. So our goal in the future is to have these pressure sensors, high resolution subsonic sensors, located in a network ahead of the storm so that we can triangulate these individual features. We'll also have a network of the windy palms uh, set up right along the coast to measure the wind speed as well as pressure data. And we'll have a network of storm surge sensors or the surgenators that are set out in advance, basically uh, measuring the depth of storm surge flooding uh, based on the weight of that water. Also uh, calculating its salinity, uh, factoring that into the calculation of the depth of the storm surge. So we definitely have a lot of plans uh, moving forward here. But this is our result. Uh, thanks to Mark, Chase, and Spin on Twitter for performing the calculations and triangulating those individual ups and downs, those pressure whipsaws as they pass through. Thank you to Josh Morgerman, iCyclone, for providing his uh, Kestrel data, uh, very valuable Kestrel data, and syncing all those clocks. Incredible attention to detail. And also Mike Tice uh, for uh, supplying that pressure data from Windy Palms. We're still going through the wind speed data from Windy Palms, but it does appear that that sensor is located just downstream of a large condo complex. And uh, we did deploy Windy Palms anticipating onshore flow coming in from a hurricane making landfall just to the west of that location. But instead we had easterlies impacting the centroid of that eye, which did set up perfectly for our pressure calculations. Uh, having these three uh, data sets so close together and knowing their exact location and knowing the resolution of that data, we're able to perform these rough calculations. And Mark says that there could be about a 10% error associated with that, uh, which means that these tornado-like vortices could have been spinning around somewhere in the upper 70s in terms of miles an hour, all the way up into the 90s. Uh, but our calculation landed on about 85 miles an hour of those passing from an east to a west direction. So thank you. Facebook supporters for making this research possible as we continue to expand our tornado and our hurricane research uh, without our supporter community. Uh, we wouldn't be collecting any of this data. Uh, it also makes possible our live storm chasing and these live uh, briefings like this. I'm gonna transition into a more of a educational style of briefing as we're going into the off season. Basically a storm chasing school, also going over some basic meteorology uh, as well as we move into the off season. Uh, but right now we're still in full-blown chase mode during hurricane season. I'm monitoring early to middle October for the development of a Central American gyre down there in the southwestern Caribbean. And there is a chance that a, uh, another hurricane could come out of that in the late season and move into the Gulf of Mexico. So definitely keeping a close eye on that uh, early to middle October uh, time period where there could be another tropical cyclone uh, in the southwestern Caribbean from that Central American gyre. But in the meantime, I am in full leaf peeping mode so I'm heading back out uh, to sample some of those bright yellow aspens, fly the drone over those, ride my mountain bike uh, today, and uh, sample some of those fall colors for you guys as we're definitely approaching peak here in the Colorado Rockies in the higher elevations. So thank you everybody for joining me uh, for my weather reports. And uh, just thank you everybody uh, for being interested in this data. And uh, I hope you guys have a great rest of your Thursday. Never stop chasing.